You're watching Secrets of Tomorrow's Leaders. My name is Corin Young from RK Studios, and this podcast is produced in partnership with JCI Santa Clarita. We've got a special show today. We're talking about fundraising, something that I dread, but uh, is very important in any business or nonprofit organization. I've got two guests with me. We've got Michelle Ray, who is the executive director at the College of the Canyons Foundation, and Mallory Staley, who's the senior consultant at American Philanthropic. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having, for having us. us. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like I said, fundraising is something that I am not uh, one to enjoy, but I know that it's important. And you guys made a career out of it, which is which is awesome. So I want to ask you guys, kind of what you do and how you got into it. Michelle, I'll start with you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it was, it's kind of odd how I ended up getting into it. I think a lot of individuals end up having a random kind of fell into it backstory. Uh, my undergrad was in mathematics. And after I graduated from college, I started working at a law firm as an analyst. And I actually lost a patient to cancer. And it really affected me. And I said I wanted to give back, do something on the weekends to, to better someone else. So I started volunteering at a local cancer hospital called City of Hope in their philanthropy department and just loved it fell in love with it, quit my law firm job, and started working in philanthropy. And that's when I realized this is what I want my career to be, you know, for the rest of my life. And I started focusing on professional development, uh, getting certifications in nonprofit management to kind of get my feet wet to see is this something that I want to do forever. Decided to go back to grad school at the age of 30 and get a master's in uh, public administration with an emphasis on nonprofit management and fundraising. And from there, my career just ended up, you know, skyrocketing, being able to get promoted, promotion after promotion because of the accolades, uh, did fundraising for City of Hope, for Santa Clara University, now at College of the Canyons. Um, and I, I, like you said, I've definitely made a career out of it. Is all that education uh, required for the job that you do? Or would people be able to do it just by somehow... Uh... I, I guess, building their way up or, or with that kind of experience? Yeah, I think what I would say is my uh, professional education and the continued education that I've done made it easier for me to move faster in terms of, uh, you know, climb the ladder faster. And uh, in addition to that, being able to start at different organizations um, I've been in healthcare philanthropy, then you can move to higher ed, you can do athletics, you can do the private sector because you have a good knowledge of everything versus somebody who's only done higher ed fundraising for their life can probably, you know, that's their comfort zone. They probably would feel uncomfortable if there was a higher position offered, but it's in a different sector that might deter somebody because they don't know how to work with NGOs or whatnot. Um, so I guess the the having the background and the experience helps you feel comfortable and confident in pivoting to any kind of role. Um, but you don't need to have it. Absolutely not. It, you know, like I said, a lot of the individuals that are that are that I know right now, they're directors and senior directors and AVPs uh, didn't have those professional accolades, uh, but they've been at institutions for a really long time. Yeah, that's that's pretty fascinating. Uh, Mallory, you work also in fundraising, but for a private consulting firm. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into that? Yeah, that's right. So I started my career at a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit in Washington, D.C., and then I worked for it in Phoenix, Arizona as well. So we were doing get out the vote efforts in 120 degrees, walking door to door, making cold calls, which is good character building, but is probably the worst job you could possibly have. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I just wanted to do something different and found like a just services assistant job. So kind of like bottom rung at a consulting firm in downtown Phoenix called American Philanthropic. And um, I just thought it'd be really nice to just kind of see if I liked to do fundraising and um, mentor groups. I kind of have that mentorship um, attitude and I really like to talk all day. So being a consultant <laughs> it worked out. Um, but yeah, so I've uh, climbed the ladder there. It's been really rewarding. Um, I'm now a senior consultant and I've worked with a couple dozen groups that do really just missions that I'm passionate about. And that's the nice thing for me is that Yes, I started at the consulting firm side, um, and I'd like to jump over to uh, actually working for one mission at a nonprofit um, eventually, but I just recognize that I've been able to work with all these different groups in these different sectors, so I know, okay, hey, I might want to go work in human services or in education or in public policy because I kind of know how those nonprofit works, nonprofits work, how they structure their programs and how they fundraise. So it's been um, still pretty early in my career. I've only been doing um, 
the consulting for five years and I was at the nonprofit for a couple years before that. So uh, who knows where I'll land, but it is definitely one of those things where I'm like, I'm going to be in fundraising and in the nonprofit sector my entire career. And I originally thought I was going to go to law school. And so it's interesting how that worked out. But yeah, how, how funny. So American Philanthropic, I guess, is a private consulting firm that's hired by nonprofits. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So w what kind of uh, organizations would hire this kind of company? Yeah, so we work with all kinds of different sectors. Uh, kind of name the big three, human services, education, and public policy, uh, the ones that I've specifically worked with. But um, we, we work on capital campaigns. We help do strategic planning. We do personnel searches. Uh, we'll help groups uh, with their digital efforts. So uh, building out their email marketing platforms or their social media and getting Google ad grants um, or what have you. And then we also help them launch donor clubs and plan giving. And these are all words that nobody probably knows except for Michelle um, that, you know, I'm sure people listening to this may, might have uh, some idea. But yeah, there's a lot of different things that nonprofits need help with, especially if their uh, specific expertise or experience is limited. And so we can kind of help fill that void without them having to, you know, and this is a common thing, Michelle would agree, is that the nonprofit sector has a lot of turnover and is a lot of, it's really hard to find good talent. So a lot of times uh, people come to us just really in need and uh, it's nice to be able to fill that gap for them. Yeah. Even on that, because she just said there's a lot of turnover, it's mainly because there's always a lot of jobs available. And that's one of the really great things about being a fundraiser is that you will rarely be without a job because mm -hmm. so many organizations, so many institutions always need a fundraiser, always. Yeah, I guess that's something that I that I hadn't considered. But while most jobs, the uh, the employer is always thinking, can I afford to have this person? Like, I need the job done, but this costs me so much money. Where somebody in fundraising is literally going to bring in money. Right. There's always a positive ROI as long as they're doing their job right. Yeah. Yeah, but um, now I I don't know how well these jobs pay. I don't know if it's uh, working for a school or working for. Um, the hospital. American Red Cross or, right. yeah, or whatever, yeah. whatever, but they're, they're all, even nonprofits are basically set up as a business, right? And they have the, like a whole hierarchy and the people at the top can, can do pretty well. Is there good money in fundraising, in the fundraising industry? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, I can, I can let you know that it's actually public information because nonprofits have to operate with that level of transparency. You can go pull up any nonprofit's 990 and scroll to the section that has how much the top three to five individuals are getting paid in an organization and you can see their salaries right then and there. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name any specific organizations or specific names, but I can tell you that some of the top healthcare philanthropy officials, the people who are anywhere from a exec, you know, assistant vice president all the way up to the CPO, the chief philanthropy officer. Um, they probably make anywhere from 175, 200K a year to 500K a year. Um, I've seen some salaries in the 725K a year. That's nuts. And then you also can get uh, bonuses if like f goals are reached and whatnot. You can get, you know, a 5% of your, 10% of your salary kind of bonus. So uh, absolutely at the top, it's it's six figures for sure. Yeah. yeah, and we were talking about this a little earlier, but, um, you know, there's also other ways that you can go about it. I mean, obviously, you can be in the consulting side, which usually don't make as much money as if you're working actually at the nonprofit. But you can also be um, an advisor to big donors that have a lot of money they want to give away. You can be their gatekeeper um, in charge of, you know, putting their funds out um, to, to groups that are worthy um, of receiving funding. Or you can work for a charitable foundation and you're also going to look uh, you're going to get something in the six figure range uh, for those jobs as well. So, yeah. Wow. It's it's funny that so rich people would be able to hire somebody and say, I have so much money. <laughs> I need to find out how to get rid of it. Can I hire you to consult for me? It's a great problem to have because, you know, because they have so much money, they're getting hit up from a lot of different organizations. And so us being the philanthropic experts, we're able to vet the organizations, know what to look for in terms of reputation. Uh, do they give the money where they're supposed to give, where they say that they're going to give? How much do they pay the people at the top or their employers? Um, what's their impact? And you vet the organizations to make sure that when you make that connection for the purpose to make sure that this organization aligns with what this philanthropic donor's passions are, that uh, their money's going to be spent well. Okay. So it sounds to me like when I think of 
fundraising. I have flashbacks of being in elementary <laughs> school and having to have my parents sell magazines to their coworkers, or like even the, like the Girl Scouts selling their cookies, or the the Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts selling the popcorn, uh, selling chocolate bars, right? And so you're you're selling something for a dollar here and there. And at the end of a month, you might have 75 bucks or 100 bucks to help send you to band camp or wherever it is that you're going. <laughs> I feel like you guys are dealing with fundraising where you're trying to hit people up for 1,000 bucks or 10,000 bucks. Or a lot more. Yeah. Or 15 million. <laughs> yeah, a no. lot more. Yeah, I've done a $15 million ask that was uh, between three different universities, 5 million to each university. Wow. So imagine getting a 5% of millions. <laughs> yeah. And that brings up a good point because, you know, you're not selling a candy bar or a bag of popcorn or Girl Scout cookies. You're selling a mission and impact that that donor can have um, on their community or, you know, whatever they're specifically interested in. You know, maybe they want to help the homeless. Maybe they want to fund animal shelters. Maybe they want to fund College of the Canyons. You know, they're, they have a distinct interest in improving something. And maybe they can do it with their time, so they can do it with their money. And so um, it's way less transactional. It's not here's this candy bar for a dollar. It's this is you know what we're gonna do with your fifteen million dollars. And and then it's a relationship between that person. It's really, um, you know, a win win. It's a fruitful partnership that you're trying to build, not just one candy bar and you're done. And with those major gifts, the hundred thousand dollars up and a million and up and fifteen million. Uh, it's not like it's just that easy to go out there and ask somebody for a significant amount of money. The average length from, you know, introduction to solicitation right now is about 18 to 24 months in terms of how long it takes for you to get to that point where you're ready to ask somebody for a significant gift because you've built a relationship. You've identified what they're passionate about. You've linked that passion back to your institution and you've cultivated them to see what kind of impact they could make if they made an investment. This always surprises people. I'm sure Michelle does this all the time and I see clients do it. But you get to the point where donors are inviting you to their kid's wedding and they're inviting you to their baby shower. Like you are a part of their life. You're their friend. You're not just. I had donors at my wedding. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. But, but right. Also, Which is even better. <laughs> you you kind of have to go if you ever want to uh, stay in touch with them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, because you're I mean, if if they think it's transactional and they think that, you know, you're just using them for their money. I mean, obviously, that's not a fruitful partnership, right? Right. But you made a good point in terms of how we've come away from the candy bars and the magazines and the gift wrapping paper. I remember having to do that when I was young. Yeah. And now we're doing uh, annual appeals, which is, you know, direct mail. We're sending letters out in the mail. We're doing events where we have people come out. Uh, we do fr the frontline fundraising, which is the face-to-face, -face, asking somebody personally for a gift. Uh, there's digital, a lot of online mar uh, marketing and online fundraising going on right now as well. Yeah, so the the difference uh, you mentioned the transactional uh, fundraising, right? Where you give them a candy bar at the end of uh, like if I buy a candy bar from a kid in front of Target, five minutes later I don't ever have to see him again. He doesn't see me. There's no kind of accountability because we're done with that transaction. Versus when you're getting ten thousand bucks or a hundred thousand bucks from a donor for a school, for example, I I suspect that after you've worked with them for 18, 24 months and you ask them for money, it doesn't end there. It's just some no, kind of accountability. They want to know that that mission is being followed through and carried out. And then only after you've completed that mission a year or two later, you can hit them up again, right? Yeah, you actually made a good point of hitting them up again. There's a whole donor cycle. And the last step of the donor cycle is repeat. And you go through that cycle of after you solicit and you get a gift, that's the stewardship phase that starts where you're showing your, your gratitude and you're bringing them into the organization to show them the impact of their gift, thanking them for their gift uh, and helping them feel, you know, feel appreciated. And then, of course, you're you're trying to resolicit them, upgrade their giving. Maybe they came in through uh, Michelle mentioned direct mail, which I'm sure Anybody on this that's listening to this podcast has probably received some kind of solicitation letter in the mail, whether, you know, the big ones, American Cancer Society or, you know, Red Cross or St. Jude. Yeah, right, right. The March, ones that March send, of Dimes. Right. The ones that send you yeah, the little penny on the March of Dimes or they send you um, the little return address labels. And then uh -huh. you're like, dang, I got to send them some money because they printed my name on here. So say you send them ten dollars. Now you're in their what's called their house file and they're going to keep mailing you. You know, some groups mail monthly, some groups mail quarterly, some groups. Groups, you know, they don't do well in the direct mail area and maybe they only mail something at the year year end charitable giving uh, season. But but yeah, you want to continue to solicit that person 
and build the relationship and cultivate them so that you're moving them up the ladder slowly. And then once they're in your, you know, major gifts portfolio, it's way less of those direct mail letters and more face to face building the relationship. Like Michelle said, you're not asking for money every time you're like building your relationship, you're hanging out with them, you're getting coffee, you're asking them how their kids are doing. So there, yeah, there's a whole donor cycle and it does not end at the first interaction that you have. Yeah. Wow. It, it's interesting because, yeah, you mentioned that they'll keep sending you stuff because you're not like a cold lead anymore. Now you're like a warm or hot lead. Yeah. The, whenever my friends are doing some kind of a, um, you know, a walk run, trying to raise money for something, I'll give something. I'm not a huge donor at all, but sure. I'll usually donate like $18 just symbolically. And then I'm getting stuff from Children's Hospital or whatever all the time. And I feel bad because I know that they spend way more than $18 like mailing me stuff hitting me. You'd be surprised. It could cost them as little as a dollar or or less. Maybe, but just with the yeah. postage alone, I'm yeah. like, well, there goes my donation. <laughs> you know? Can I ask but, you a quick question? Yeah. Would you mind sharing with us a story about an incident that happened in your life that was life-changing? Oh my goodness. Put me on the spot. Do <laughs> I have a story like that? I think I see where you're going with this. Yeah, I try, you, you're you're trying to see like what's something that I am passionate about. Because you I'd just be mentioned to. your friends going and doing a walk run, uh -huh. and you may not have a personal connection to that, and that's why you only give eighteen dollars. Right. But it's just hypothetically speaking, if you had a family member pass away from cancer, specifically maybe breast cancer, if somebody came to you and said, "We're creating a new breast cancer center at this cancer hospital, and we'd like you to come just to hear from the doctors that are going to be there and check out what we're doing." you absolutely would get invested. Then you start to just see what they're doing, attending some events, listening to their doctors. You hear about the amazing research that they're doing. And before you know it, you're giving $100, $200, $500, $1,000. dollars That's the, That was the the idea of making sure that there's that personal connection. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It okay. gets you invested in an organization. So while I haven't personally donated any large sums like that, um, I will say that about 12 years ago, I lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's. And that's impacted my family in a big way. And so a few years ago, when there was the, the Alzheimer's walk uh, here in Santa Clarita, my family signed up not just to donate a couple of bucks, but like as a team to do this. And we solicited funds from, um, from our friends and family. And I think we ended up being like one of the top three uh, funders. We well, raised like 1800 bucks or something, which yeah. was pretty good. That's great. Cause, and it's easier to do. It comes easier when it's something that you have a personal tie and a personal connection to. Yeah. And they ask you to do that too on the, uh, when you create like a, a site to send to your friends, you know, the, it, share a personal story. Hey, yeah. I'm I lost telling the story. So, right. so and so, and it's, you know, the most heartbreaking thing. No one should ever have to go through that. You know, please help us walk to fund research so no one ever has to in the future. Yeah. So if Corin, if you, um, were left an inheritance or you won the lottery or you get to an age where you have disposable income to give away. And the first nonprofit you're probably going to think of is Alzheimer's Association, you know? So that's kind of how people, you know, maybe millennials aren't giving money yet, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to, right? They're going to get to a point where they have some money to give away. And um, maybe that happens when they're 65 and maybe it happens when they're 45. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good ways to think about that stuff. Now, we were talking about different ways to fundraise, right? Like the magazines and the chocolate bars. But what are some more uh, modern, like newer ways that uh, businesses or nonprofits are fundraising? Uh, well, for businesses specifically, we see a lot of partnerships between businesses and nonprofits where uh, they will support, they sponsor specific types of events. Also, um, I know right now one of the ones that we're doing in collaboration with a digital virtual event that we have, if individuals want to make a donation for $50, they'll get a little charcuterie board. If they give a gift of $100, then they'll get a charcuterie board and a little bottle of wine. And so we obviously are paying a certain dollar amount for those, you know, for those items, but the overhead is a donation. And that's one way that a lot of individuals and organizations and institutions are trying to incorporate, especially in this digital world of how can we get you to be a part of an online fundraising event, but still give you something to experience at home, bring something, you know, to the home. They partner with businesses to buy items at a discounted rate, and then the overhead is the donation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not even a discounted rate. Like I see stuff on PBS where it's like donate a hundred hours and get a t-shirt. That's no discount, but I guess they're probably getting it at a discount. But uh, a lot of times you're not even doing it 
to get a good deal on the thing. It's, you know. Yeah, or businesses are donating their item as, a, as an in-kind gift. It's a tax write-off for them. They're going to donate for free a whole bunch of, of their items, and then you get to utilize them and give them away. Yes. And then when you give money, now that nonprofit has your name and hopefully your phone number and your address and your email, and then they can put you into their little cycle of receiving communications, and that um, answers part of your question about new ways to fundraise. Obviously, we're seeing more fundraising be done online. Um, more people are online, obviously. Uh, in the last couple of years, you know, people have wondered, you know, is direct mail going to go out of style? It hasn't yet. There's still 80% of donations come in through the mail. So it's still definitely because wow. most donors, you know, are um, are a bit older, right? They have disposable income, so they're still opening their mail. But um, there's groups now, especially after last year, more people online, spending a lot of time online. They're wondering what they can do. You know, there's Google ad grants that people um can actually get for free as nonprofits. They can apply to Google and um, have their name pop up in the search. You know, if somebody searches for certain keywords, then their nonprofit will kind of pop up at the top and it will say add, you know, with a little box. And then also, you know, promoting things on Facebook or social media. Just so um, we're seeing that become a little bit more important. But obviously, you still have to be in the mail and frontline fundraising. And I mean, you just kind of um, integrating all of those things and kind of all the pieces of the pie work together, that's how people really see success. If you only work with one channel and not the others, you're, you're less likely to, to have a successful fundraising shop. Yeah, you mentioned um, online fundraising. And that makes me think of like, I've used Kickstarter, I've used Indiegogo, both as a uh, fundraiser and as a backer for other campaigns. Things like uh, GoFundMe, uh, are you guys experienced with uh, platforms like that? Yeah, um, I've used a lot of those platforms in the past, especially to create third party fundraising options. Um, peer to peer fundraising is really large. If I had to give my personal opinion, I would always say if you know that you want to donate to a specific type of um, organization or a specific need, go straight to that organization because all of those or, uh, you know, websites that you named take a portion off the right. top. And so it's technically, it's a, even though it's a small amount, it's a piece of money that's going to their business. It's a pretty big amount depending on... It's like on... 5% for GoFundMe, I think. So it can make a difference. And all of yeah. these other, you know, nonprofits, they have a platform to be able to make a donation online nine times out of 10. Uh, and so I, I say if you care about supporting cancer, don't go to someone's GoFundMe page or Kickstarter page, go straight to, you know, can National Cancer Society or the specific hospital that you want to support because you can uh, donate straight there and they don't, no one else gets a cut off the top. Right? Yeah, it's funny. When I was uh, donating for one of my films, uh, we used Indiegogo. And I think at the time they were taking like 9%. Wow. And we knew that, but we still had people saying, hey, you know, should I give you a check? And we said, no, no, go through the interface. We did that on purpose because we knew how much we wanted to raise. And when other people look at it, if you've raised $55 out of your $20,000 goal, it looks like you're nowhere close to it. But if somebody gives you a few hundred bucks and another few hundred bucks, like you, you get a little bit closer and it makes yeah, it look- Yeah, and that's the nice thing about Go, GoFundMe. You can start at a lower level and kind of go up. And I think sometimes people opt to use GoFundMe because a lot of people have an account and they're familiar with it and they yeah. know that the money's probably, you know, it's not a scam. It's going to go to the right people. Cause GoFundMe has some protocols that they set up. So if it's a short term fundraising initiative, like somebody has cancer and they need, you know, help paying for treatment or help, you know, paying for a funeral or something, then I think GoFundMe makes sense. But usually the people have a relationship to that person anyway. So it's not a long term fundraising strategy for a nonprofit, but it might be for something small. Yeah. Yeah. And the other things that you see on Indiegogo or Kickstarter aren't so much nonprofits. It's businesses that they just need to raise some money to get their to scale up their production or something like that. But you just see a lot of nonprofits, and I wanted to ask, why is it so important to for individuals to fund a nonprofit organization? Because these nonprofits don't have a lot of money to begin with. You know, there's a reason why there's that stigma where you thought there's not a lot of money in a career in fundraising or a career in nonprofit work it's because you automatically associate nonprofits with. Not a lot of money, not yeah. the big corporate giants that are bringing in billions and billions of dollars. Um, you know, even though there is a lucrative career in this, these organizations still need money because as a nonprofit, when you get that designation, that 501c3 designation, you're basically saying that everything that you bring in, you're giving back out. And you're you're giving out to salaries, you're giving it out to operations, you're giving it out to the patients that need the support, you're giving it out to the researchers, you're giving it out to the students that need scholarships. You're basically saying all of the money that we bring in, we're going to put towards something good. Um, and so that's why there is that need to support the nonprofits because they give they give it to uh, reputable reputable um, you know departments. And even as a as an example, 
uh, and this is going to be a shameless plug for you know one of the one of the organizations that we support. Um, but it's called Cranio Care Bears. When my son was two months old, he was diagnosed with something called craniosynostosis, which is where one of the soft spots in his skull fused too early. So when he was four months old, he had to have his skull reconstructed. And this organization called Cranio Care Bears heard about us. And uh, at no cost to us, it cost us nothing. A few days before his surgery, we got this amazing care package from them that had pajamas, rattlers, teething rings, toys for him, a little prayer chain to hang on his uh, his crib. And then for the parents, it had toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, trail mix, socks, you know, things like that, deodorant to help you out in the hospital. And it cost us nothing. But this organization, Cranio Care Bears, needs donations. They need money and they need, um, you can go onto their Amazon wish list and you can buy gum to you know th- to send to them so they can put it in these care packages for other families because everything that they do is going back out to support kids who are about to have surgery and they make these care packages and there's a lot of you know expenses that go into that from postage and and all of the supplies and so that's one reason why you support uh, nonprofits because they're doing something really really good with their funds right so like you said earlier I guess you have to find one that is passionate about the same thing that's important to you well and has you know a good reputation obviously if they if they've been around for a little while they have specific programs and they have people that that execute those programs and do them well there's some uh tools you can use online like charity navigator um guide star will give charities ratings um so that you can check to make sure that they're transparent and they're you know using money um the right way so so people will sometimes use those tools but um to answer your question about why to support nonprofits, I always say that nonprofits fill a need in the community. I mean, they're not raising money unless they're doing something impactful, right? Um, and a lot of times they solve some issues that the government just can't because of red tape or the government's just big and it can't send care packages to families in need, right? But a nonprofit can do that um, and they usually do it really well. So I think that it's an important part of civil society and it's an important um, part of just building strong communities, which... I find really important. <laughs> okay, let me ask you guys a personal question. You mentioned that uh, there could be good money in working for different mo- nonprofit organizations. How important is it to you personally that you share the same passion? Like, would you work for a company and help them raise funds if you didn't agree with them? Well, a, a lot of the individuals that work in philanthropy, you know, philanthropy comes from the Greek word meaning love of mankind. You do this because you actually genuinely love people. And so individuals like us, there's one reason why we can work anywhere from, uh, you know, uh, education, higher ed to a hospital, to athletics, to, you know, any small nonprofit. It's because we actually just this is what we love to do. Having a personal connection and a personal tie is just the, you know, the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. It's more that that lenders more to longevity and actually staying at a specific organization. If you have a personal tie, you probably will stay at that organization a little longer. Uh, because you are passionate about their mission. But uh, typically individuals who are in this field, it's because they actually just genuinely love helping people. Yeah, Yeah. I have nothing to add to that. That's perfect. (laughs) Okay, so uh, here in Santa Clarita, where where we all live, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations, tons of them, and they're always trying to raise money. Do you ever look at their uh, marketing or fundraising efforts and say, oh my goodness, no, this is not what you guys should be doing. You guys Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, the good news is that coming up on May 18th uh, from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, through Zoom, JCI Santa Clarita is actually hosting a fundraising workshop. And the two of you are going to be facilitating it. We will That's be. Right. We will be facilitating this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you guys have worked together many times before? No. No, we just so, met uh, the other day. So how cool is that? <laughs> so we're going to see different perspectives on fundraising, uh, new ways to do it. Uh, when to do it, how to do it, all that stuff. Yeah, it sounds like we pretty much agree on most things, but we do bring um, some different backgrounds. So it'll be it'll be good, and uh, we'll definitely leave some time for questions. So if people want to know something about um, nonprofit fundraising or even small businesses that are local that want to learn how to partner with nonprofits and drive um, revenue and some marketing questions, we can also answer some of, that, some of that as well. Yeah, so anybody who's with a nonprofit organization, anybody who is interested in funding a nonprofit organization, anyone who's got a small business that wants to partner, this seems like it'd be a good uh, workshop for, for anybody. Anyone who's a nonprofit, who is a business owner and needs money, well, they can learn how they can receive funds as well because those nonprofits are trying to give money, you know, to, to help specific areas as well. They receive yeah. money so they can give money or give services. 
So. Yeah, I'm, I'm an instructor at College of the Canyons too. And I get a list uh, periodically of like all these grants and scholarships that are available to students. And it's staggering to me to see how many of those go unclaimed. Every yes, year. it's so true. People just don't know about them a lot of times. Um, this is yeah. a, and this is another plug to support unrestricted funds un unrestricted general funds. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people give money and they want to give to a specific area because they think that that's the most important thing to give to this specific one little niche. But that's actually what makes it harder to give out uh, scholarships because I have to award it to a veteran who is also studying fire tech, but only part time and not full time. Like it's oh hard to gosh, match that yeah. up. Whether yeah. if, I, if you just say, look, I know you're going to do something good with my money. I know you're going to put it to use. Here it is and use it however you need. That's th those are the funds that we love even more. Yeah. yeah and there was one um, silver lining to COVID last year was there were some found charitable foundations and corporate um, funders that said, instead of this gift being restricted this year, I want this to go to general operating. And I'm hoping that trend sticks. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll find out. I guess right. uh, this is going to be a big year for that. So I'm looking forward to seeing both of you on May 18th. For more information, check out jcisantacruda.com or look us up on our on our socials. So Michelle, Mallory, thank you guys for coming in today. It's uh, great talking to you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, and uh, this is Secrets of Tomorrow's Leaders. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>